Okay, so, <clears throat> okay, so I decided because of this little question right here to make a very short video because I thought it was actually great and having visual media for it probably would help. Um, so Amy Helmick said, I just finished listening to the podcast that made me think of a great of a video training suggestion about Wacom tablets. I know they are meant to be customizable, but I would appreciate a video showing how you seasoned professionals have your buttons set up along with why you've chosen to do it that way. It could save a lot of trial and error and have a good starting place. I don't know if anyone else would find this helpful, but I sure would. Also, creating actions, both how-to and some you use to find helpful. I forget Got that you had actually asked about the actions part, but I'll see if I can include that as a part of this too. Um, so anyway, thank you for the question, Amy. I do appreciate that. Um, I am going to go here to my settings, and I can get rid of that. All right, so first of all, with my Wacom settings, um, I have the Intuos Pro medium size. So the, the Intuos Pro small has three, or I guess six buttons, three on each side of the wheel, where the medium has four, and I think the large has five, but I don't know, because I've never actually seen one in person. Um, but anyway, the, the, the only things that I'm setting these buttons for is for Photoshop and Lightroom, and realistically, uh, it's especially when it comes to Photoshop, I'm kind of a toss-up between whether or not I'm going to just have my hands on my tablet, or if I'm going to have one hand on a keyboard, one hand on my tablet. So anyway, I will go through this. Um, I had to set my all other applications setting for Photoshop because for some reason, even though I created a profile for it, um, it doesn't recognize when I move over to Photoshop. It just considers it some other program. Um, so as such, I had to just... I mean, all I use it for is Photoshop and Lightroom, so it's not that big of a deal because it will switch to the Lightroom controls when I move into Lightroom. Um, so just to start off here, um, I just have touch on and off as my first button. Um, that's one that I don't use a lot, but sometimes I want to play with my fingers and do that, so I think it's useful to have that on Um on there. It's, it's probably the least important button that I have. Honestly, I... I kind of got used to having um, the 3 and 3 because I used to have the Intuos Pro small and that 3 and 3 layout worked really well for what I was doing. Um, so the touch on and off, it's just kind of a nice added feature that's meh, I don't really need it. Um, then from there I have settings beneath it. That just allows me to go into the settings if I decide I'm doing something a lot or I have a particular project where I'm going to be doing the same kind of keystroke, same action. Um, I can quickly move over to settings, change something um, for for the meantime, and then change it back later. So it, it's something that I, I view this as kind of evolving. I'm, I'm constantly changing things around just based on what I'm doing a lot. Um, Realistically, I, I have my keyboard shortcuts for most of my everyday workflow. So for most everyday work that I'm doing, I'm actually just using my keyboard and not so much the buttons on the tablet. I, I use the, the clicky wheel a lot, um, but everything else, not so much. And then everything else that I have uh, as my buttons are just... Um, different tools that I use frequently. So it's pretty much the same thing that I have with my keyboard set, set up. I, I am a big advocate of going in and creating your own presets for um, hotkeys that you're gonna use without having to stretch your fingers. So, you know, it's it's not that hard, I suppose, for somebody, I don't even remember what original <laughs> keystrokes are, but um, I have all of my, my keys that I use on a regular basis um, programmed so they are all right next to the hand that I use. So I'm left-handed um, and I have H, J, K, F, L, or H, J, K, L, B, N, M, U, I, O, and P. And those are all the things that I use the most. So I'll go through those and tell you really quickly what I do for that. Um, I, I have U for rotate tool. It just allows me to, if I accidentally rotate using my fingers or something, I can very quickly reset it back to zero. And it, it's actually really useful sometimes when brushing with, with your Wacom brush. Um, there is a certain kind of movement that feels very natural and other movements that are much less natural. Um, so I'll actually rotate the view of, of the image to be able to brush in a natural fashion um, for my hand. 
Then I have I and O as just, it's essentially the exact same thing as brackets. I use that um, to adjust the size of my brush. I don't know why I, I did that, but it, it's just slightly closer than using brackets. So that's what I did. Um, then I have P, which is pen tool, which is what it always is. But it just happens to work out that I use that frequently enough that I want a hotkey nearby. And it happens to be nearby where my left hand is. And then I have... H as the lasso tool, because sometimes I need to make just a quick rough selection of something. Um, J for my brush, K for my healing brush, L for my clone stamp, and then what do I use B for? I don't really use B actually. Um, N for quick selection tool for making good selections, better quality selections re relatively quickly. And then M to be able to toggle between um, the foreground color and the background color um, so I, I do that and I essentially just set up you can see here everything else to be pretty much that so I have quick selection um, undo which is um, what is it command option Z um, I will use that actually kind of frequently on my on my keyboard just because it's right there next to where I adjust the brush size and whatnot from from the ring um, then brush healing brush toggle color and rotate view pretty much the exact same thing that I have for my hand and as such I don't use it that much because I have one hand here for my keyboard, one hand here for drawing, and it just works out really nicely for me to toggle between everything that I need there and then just use this for my clicking. Um, yeah, so there's that. From the touch ring standpoint, I have, um, well, I'll say going around. So I have zooming in and out up in the top right. The top left, I have um, hardness of brush. So... I think the shortcut for that is shift and then brackets, um, just like how you would adjust a brush larger or smaller in Photoshop um, using shift and then those will bump up the hardness or bump it down by 25%. So it's it's pretty big jumps, but realistically I'm never like, oh, I need exactly 33% hardness. Um, it's it's kind of imprecise and that's okay with me. Um, then, then below that I have brush size and then rotate, which, I never actually use. I just, I sometimes I'll, I'll accidentally click thinking that I'm going back over to zoom and then I go to rotate and then I rotate it and I'm like, Oh dang it. And that's when I press you and go back to the normal view. Um, so yeah, that's, that's how I have it set up for Photoshop. Also on, on my pen, I have the front button as option because I'm constantly with the brush tool and, um, with the healing brush when or clone stamp anything that you have to select samples um sampling uh, is an option click so i can just click that button and then select the thing and i'm option clicking really easily instead of having to use my other hand to do that um, and then the back button i just use as a right click because right clicks are still pretty important um in fact i've everything else i've kind of messed around with but those two buttons are things that i've kept pretty much the same since I started using a tablet. Um, yeah, okay, then I personally prefer to have my mapping set to mouse. I know a lot of people have it um, so that they they would rather have it as pen, which means, here, I'll, I'll just use the actual screen that I am on as my visual tablet. So if this screen, this area that I'm in, which actually I guess it's smaller for the view that I have on here. Um, as I move from one side of the screen over to the other, that's going to move, or one side of the tablet all the way over to the other, that's going to move my cursor from one side all the way to the other side. And if I move down, it's gonna move all the way down to the corner and and so on and so forth. It maps the, the tablet surface exactly as your screen. Um, a lot of people like that because that means that you can do very small movements, which is very ergonomically sound. Um, you can do very small movements in order to move further across the screen. Um, but I find that realistically, I, I end up doing a lot more moving of my arm that way. Um, I'm really, when I'm using my tablet, I usually use an area about this big. And I have it on mouse mode, which means that when I put the pen down or when I hover the pen close enough, it will move the mouse and then when I pick up and go back, it's not going to automatically hop back to where it was like it would with the pen mode. It'll leave the cursor where it was, and then as I move again, it'll just continue that movement. So I can do this kind of a motion without clicking, just you know, 
moving to scroll the mouse around. And I find that then I'm just using my fingers instead of having to move, move my whole hand. Now I know with, with pen mode, you can also change the, the mapping area from the full area of the full surface of your Wacom tablet um, down to a portion. And you can select like a specific portion. Oh, I'm on the screen version. Um, you can select how much of that screen you want or how much of your tablet you want to be that portion. So that's one way that if you want to be still keep really minimal movements of your wrist and map the entire screen, that's that's another good way to do it. I find that in that case, it ends up being a little bit too crazy and all over the board. Um, and as such, I, I just, I started using mouse because it kind of made sense to me in the same way that, you know, if you have a physical mouse and you move it, and it hits the computer or something, and then you lift it up and set it back down and move it, the mouse isn't going to suddenly jump back to where it originally was on the screen. It's just going to keep going in that direction. And it, so it just intuitively made sense to me at the start, and that's the way that I've kept it. Um, mouse height, I keep it right around medium. You get pretty used to where your hovering point is when you engage everything. And I keep my acceleration relatively high because I do want my mouse to move pretty quickly. Um, so acceleration and speed are on the higher end for both of those. Um, that's that's just me. That's my personal preference. You can do whatever whatever you want. Um, yeah, is that everything? Oh, okay. So I went through everything for for Photoshop. Now, as far as the pen and the mapping and all that, that's going to stay the same whether I'm in Photoshop or Lightroom. Um, if I am in Lightroom, though, my buttons here are different, and I actually tend to use these a bit more. Um, so especially if I'm like sitting on a couch with my wife and I, I want to quickly call through everything. Um, I can kind of just sit with my buttons there and move through everything. Um, all right. So I will go to Lightroom to actually show you what's happening with some of these things in the develop module. Everything that I have for my Lightroom preset is totally set up for develop, not for anything else. So the first two, the top two buttons up here are moving through my menu items through the basic panel. So for anybody that knows, you can use a plus and minus, plus and minus key to adjust, it's by default the exposure, um, but you can actually use your caret, so it's the period and comma buttons um, to switch between what area of the basic menu you're, you're editing. So temperature, tint, exposure, contrast, and it just goes down that list. And once you get to the end, it'll go right back up to the top. So I have my top two buttons here um, set to move through those for me because, um, let's see, which one is it? So what is my rotate in Photoshop? So the bottom right corner um, is actually set to adjust Let's go back to exposure. Um, I have my exposure ring to adjust up and down from that. So I can just move through my settings, go down to the next thing, contrast. Nah, I want to bring down the highlights a little bit, bring up my shadows, bring up my whites a little, and my blacks are went, went way too far there because this is a pretty contrasty image. Um, but that, that just allows me to kind of toggle between each of these settings and then just make little adjustments with my thumb, which is, which is really handy. That way you're not hovering over each one and having to click and drag each of these sliders. It's just like um, using your plus and minus keys. Um, but you're, if you think of your keyboard, your plus and minus keys, at least for Mac users, are up at the top of the keyboard. And then that period and comma are down at the bottom. So you kind of have to constantly move down between the two of them or keep your fingers sitting kind of like this. Or I suppose you could use your thumb, uh, but you're using a much wider grip. So a lot of the things that I do, um, I think I mentioned in this podcast that I th I'm getting some like beginner carpal tunnel or at least like my wrists can get kind of tight at times. Um, so I keep my hand, I try and keep my hand movements to a minimum and in a very like natural pose already having your hands on a keyboard um, downwards is an unnatural pose. Um, your hand naturally wants to rest sideways and keyboards aren't meant that way. So I want to just take as little stress on the repetitive motion side as possible. And this is one way that I can kind of keep things to a very minimum. Um, 
Then I have right arrow just to advance to the next photo. R for crop. Um, something that I tend to do a lot uh, if, if I'm doing like batch editing, um, it's especially anything where it's headshots where, you know, uh, it's an eight by 10 aspect ratio, things like that, or, or anything. If I'm going through them, I'll just arrow key R and fix my crop arrow key R fix my crop arrow key, so on and so forth. Um, I'm going to go back and undo all of the horrible damage that I've been doing. So, anyway, um, that's that's that. Then the bottom, the bottom ones here, um, I have pick and reject. So I'm not going to do that because I, I don't want to reject any of these, but just P and X. Um, you can do those on your keyboard, but again, they're they're not very close. So you have one hand on pick, one hand on reject. If you're going through and doing pick and reject and not um, flagging by stars or something like that, um, it's it's just not very... <laughs> Um, it's not useful. It's, it's not good for that. Let me see if I have a good example of a shoot that I've done recently that might, oh, I mean, develop derp. Um, all right. You get to look at me, look at me do my calling on, on catheters. Um, so what I was talking about in the, the podcast is just set your filter to unflagged. So by, by nature, everything is going to be unflagged. And then I will just really quickly go through and pick and reject everything. So that's good, bad, bad, good, good, bad. And it'll automatically remove those because now they have flags on them and so on and so forth. So once I've gone through the whole calling process, then I'll, I'll be able to s hit my select and then go through. And from there, I will label stuff realistically i do three four and five but i have hotkeys set for just three and five because a three is something that i'm probably not going to do much with and a five is like yeah totally good option so i'll go through and set everything to say oh wait no what am i doing i don't want to do that so i you hit caps lock and then as you rate something by stars, it will automatically advance to the next image, and so on, and so forth, and so on, and so forth. Um, lovely images of catheters. I know you're jealous of all that fine work that I've done. Um, anyway, so so that's that's those settings as far as Lightroom goes. Then my, my touch ring is going to be pretty much, I, I left most everything just as its basics. Um, one thing that is useful is the top left corner is going to naturally by default be cycle layers and that's going to move, allow you to quickly move through all of your images. So if you have a need for this for some reason, if you want to just kind of quickly glance through everything, you can, you know, use your ring to, to move through those. Um, brush size, I'm not using a brush really in Lightroom hardly ever. And then the, the, the plus and minus is really just for my um, develop module. Words. Words are good. Um, so yeah, there's there's that. I don't know if this even does anything. Yeah, auto scroll doesn't do anything. I don't use it that much. That uh, goes to show what I'm actually using. So that's everything as far as setting up my Wacom tablet goes. Um, it's it's pretty basic, pretty, pretty simple. Um, I'm saying um too much. Somebody reminded me recently that I say um a lot, and I'm sorry. I'm sorry, guys. I shouldn't do that. Okay. So now on to your second question of actions. I'll edit this photo for... Sure, why not? Um, let's edit a copy so I don't mess anything up. Realistically, I probably won't save this, so that's fine. Um, okay. What's up, Photoshop? Let's open up. Let's do this. Slowly but surely. It's because I have that giant Pendleton whiskey um, image in there. So, so anyway, 
as far as creating actions go, by default, I think that actions panel is typically not in button mode. I prefer everything to be in button mode because this is the foldering system and then this is what each of your actions are. So to play an action for this mode, you have to click on whichever one it is and then go down and press play for it to happen, which is fine, but that's kind of stupid because if you're in button mode, it's a button and you can just click the button and the action plays out. Um, so in general, I, I know that we talked about creating actions for things that you do a lot. I, I would say even if you just have a few layers that you tend to do all of the time, um, create your own actions for that. So I'm going to create a new folder called sample. And that's just with this little folder icon down here. And that's really nice for just keeping everything intact in that area. Um, so when you create a new action, you click on this, set say what set you want it to be. You can set it to a function key, which means at least on, on Mac, you have to press the FN button and then whatever the function key is. And you can have modifiers to that. So you could do FN shift act, or F4 for example, for the action. And then something that you can do is set colors. I recommend doing that because as you saw earlier, when I'm in button mode, those colors translate to colorful buttons. So you can set different actions to different things. Now I recently cleared out everything. I, I kind of, with more instruction happening, I just use these basic uh, actions and pull in things for my own personal proce processes when I need them, which is pretty rare. Um, but it, part of my sc spring cleaning, I was like, well, I don't want to like be stuck in my workflow forever. Let's let's remove some stuff that you don't use a lot. Um, all right. Anyway, back to what I was saying. So in that one, we'll say we want this one to be an orange button. And you can name it whatever you want. And then you click record. And from here on, it will just record the things that you do um, until you press stop. So it's not recording in real time. It just records what the, the actions you are taking are. So say I want to create a dodge and burn action. Now, the way that I do dodging and burning is using my curves layers. Um, so what I will do is create two curves. I'll name one of them dodge. One of them burn. And then I am going to select these two and group them. Name that group. Name that group Dodge and Burn 1. Then I want to go into this first one, which is Dodge. And I will increase the exposure and select the mask. Make sure the mask is selected. Press Invert. Then click on Burn decrease the exposure, select the mass, invert, select both of these, change their blend modes to luminosity, because I don't want to affect the color when I dodge and burn, I just want to affect the brightness of, of the thing. And for safe measure, I always recommend using a dummy layer. to remove the saturation so I can just see the luminosity, which is the thing that I am creating. Then once I'm done with that, you know, you can do whatever you might want to be doing, but once you're done with that action, you just press stop. So once I delete that out, if I go back to button mode now, I can click on the whatever you want button and I have my dodge and burn all set up. The one thing that you want to make sure of when you're doing that, say in the action pack that I use to teach retouching that I hand out to people, I have two stages of dodging and burning. Um, so I have dodge and burn one, which is for fine grain stuff, and then I have my, my general dodge and burn for larger structural stuff. And because I have that, you will notice I had to be careful about the way that I named everything. Because if this one says dodge and burn, 
I had to change the name to the other one, Dodge and Burn General, because if I were to click on Dodge and Burn first, so these layers Dodge and Burn are in there, and then I tried doing the exact same thing with the next group and naming these two curves layers Dodge and Burn, then it would automatically select whatever the first dodge the first layer named dodge was so it would go down here and try and do every all the steps from there so sometimes you'll you'll run into little moments like that where you you see little things that need correcting or you need to change something around so i'm going to delete both of these just to be safe and we'll say I played this, and I realized after the fact, oh, you know what? I don't want this. I don't want to select the layer dodger. I don't want to change the name. From there, so what? I, how do you do this again? Um, it's been a little bit of time since I've done this last. Uh, make adjustment layer, make adjustment layer. I need to actually see. So one thing that's nice about this is if you have an action pack, um, you can actually go through and follow the the exact steps that somebody else has done. So so the re the way that I figured out how to use the parameters of frequency separation the first time I learned how to do it was that I went in to the frequency separation action that I had gotten from somebody else, and I went to look at everything that was in here. So I was like, okay, Gaussian and blur, apply image. What what settings do we have in the apply image and you can say source rgb and and when you go to image oh well i need to actually have an image layer selected i'm i'm just all over the board right now so i'm sorry for that but yeah So I'm going to just walk through all of the, what's it called? Whatever, we'll say that's, that's what this is. And I can go to image, apply image, and just go look at the action set here and say, okay, with calculation. So my source is the RGB layer low, which I would have named that layer that I did low. So that's background copy one with inverted source RGB blend mode calculation is set to add and scale two. And look at that. It told me exactly what this person did for me to do that. So that's, that's one way to actually learn a bunch of things is if you get other people's action sets, you can see the way that they're setting everything up. So even though you just click a button and everything shows up, um, you can gain a deeper understanding of what's happening by going through and looking here. What was the point of this? I don't remember. Oh, if I want to change something. So if I want to set current layer... So if I need to add things in here and say, oh, I forgot after I do this, I need to make a layer and then I need to select layer dodge and burn. You can actually go back, click on the step where something happened and follow through again. Now I know that there's a way to delete elements of this, but I can't for the life of me remember <laughs> how to do those things. And I've totally messed this action, this fake action up at this point. Um, it took me a long while while to figure that out, and I don't really remember off the top of my head now. I just try and make sure that I keep track of all the steps that I need to do in creating the action and then do that. And if not, I'll, I've actually gone back and just removed things and redone them. Um, like, removed the action that I just made and redo that. And that's the way that I do it. In general, it's not like advanced steps. It's not doing frequency separation that I recommend doing this for. It's anything that you do a lot. So if if you constantly, if you know that you're going to want to batch edit with a certain color balance set on something, I would just say make an action for it. So in this one, I'm going to create something for athletic shoot, which is whatever, color for things. Record the action. And then just say, like, for whatever reason, I really like doing the 
this. For whatever reason. It's, it's a really minor action for me to go through and do all of those things. It's pretty fast. It's not, it doesn't take that long. But if I have an action for it, from here on out, the next time I need to do something like that, I have an action where I can just go in and you know click it and it applies that thing. Um, so that's 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 what all of these actions are for. Doing that when you're not horribly busy, or even when you are busy and you're frustrated and you realize, oh, I've done this same thing over and over and over and over and over again. Um, having an action to do that thing that's not just um, like a keyboard shortcut. So you don't you wouldn't create an action for select brush tool. That's something that you could just change your keyboard shortcut to. But anything where it's like I I want to create a layer with an inverted mask um, with these parameters set on it. It's pretty simple to do that on your own, but you can create an action for it, or you can do really advanced stuff. Um, but it's really helpful for color toning, things like that. Um, yeah, I, I hope that I've answered your question well enough. I don't know what else to say beyond that. Um, please, please let me know if this has been helpful. If not, um, let me know that too. If I didn't get to all of your questions, I'm happy to go back and try and answer things more. Um, I think this, this is kind of a cool way for me to interact with you guys. Um, if you have questions and whatnot, and it's something that's more of a visual media, I think I'm going to try and do a bit more of these kind of videos. Um, so that's all. Thank you guys very much for watching, and have a great day. Bye-bye.